biodynamic. Tell me, you know, like just briefly, like what to you is biodynamic? You know, a biodynamic farm by definition is just like a, it's, it's a place that's got its own characters and individuality and it's a, an independent uh, independent thing but the, the, the very best thing that I like about biodynamic is more or less the concept of taking from the nature and putting back into the nature uh, how is that different than say organic or traditional because right. like even like we're, where we live we're surrounded with farmers Right. And they're all, you know, giving into nature and taking from nature. So well, it, it's just, uh, let's, let's take like organic, which is, you know, the closest thing to uh, biodynamic. Uh, the, the, in a nutshell, actually, you could say biodynamic is an ultra-organic uh, way of farming. And what does that mean? Okay, well, in, in we, we do the very same things that uh, organic farming does, which is the biological part of the things. So in that aspect is similar, and that entails like cover cropping, companion plants, integration of uh, like animals in, into the farm, uh, composting, uh, no what chemical. else? Like cultivating and you know uh, things of that nature. But then the, the, so that's the biological, which in biodynamic, you still do that. Okay. But then on top of what they do, it's the dynamic part of the things. And uh, by dynamic part of it, uh, you, for example, you use certain preparations that it goes into your compost, so it enlivens uh, the soil. Another thing that you take into consideration is the planetary movements of the stars, uh, which, you know, it, that the, in organic farming is not taken into consideration. Uh, our forefathers uh, knew about stars a lot better than the new age, you know, as, as we progressed, it seemed like we forgot about you know everything that is happening, so it's that's more because less we built roofs and trusses. <laughs> <laughs> Can't see the that's, stars that's anymore. True. That is that is very true <laughs> statement. That is yeah. very true statement. Because I remember even in, in my lifetime, when we were kids, uh, like back home, in the summertime, we would go you know, just like the the houses have flat roof. So at night in the summertime, we would go and sleep, and then you'd see all the stars. So yeah. you you kind of have uh, uh, more closeness, you know, and ties to them than just completely being away from them. Yeah. No, you're absolutely right. Yeah. Uh, but so. getting back to the subject, <laughs> <laughs> of course, you know, even, even that, uh, I think it's a noble uh, industry because like, oh. you know, in the conventional framing, they used to use four or five times more wood. I'm not. I'm not de decorating yeah. that at all. And I don't want to. I'm just kind of making fun. Yeah. 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 Not at all. Yeah. I mean, that's very honorable to say. Thanks. Yeah. Uh, the the other things that's just like besides you know planetary movements, which is very important, and actually in biodynamic, the the hardest part is to to know about the whole biodynamic farming because it entails a lot of information. You just don't have some recipes and say, I put this and this together. You really need to know the relationship between the plants, the uh, farm, the animals, you know, the, the relationship between all the different stars and the effect of all the different stars not only in our life but also how they affect the growth and things like that i give you examples uh you know it's just like the near stars uh like moon mercury you, you know uh they they are very effective as far as like calcium process which is huh. you know as far as the growth and form of the plants 
So what, how does the, the moon and the stars, how do they relate to the calcium? Well, calcium process uh, is very much related in, into the, wa the water elements. Uh, and that also is very, uh, it's got a close ties, like, you know, for example, as far as growth of different, different plants, it's, it's moon and the sun that make things grow. Uh -huh. uh, as a matter of fact, uh, a lot of plants grow much bigger at night when there's the, the light of the moon. Of course, a lot of that comes through the sun and through the moon gets reflected on the earth. Uh -huh. A lot of plants' growth is more dependent on, on, the, on, on the effect of moon than the sun, and that's something that a lot of people think opposite. So as far as form and shape and uh, reproduction of plants is also very much uh, related to the near stars. But then the substance and the aroma and flavor, we get those energies from, uh, from the farther stars, like uh, Mars, Mercury, and, you know, just like, uh, the, uh, and uh, Jupiter, we, the, those, those uh, the affect the, uh, you know, here we have calcium process, and then the silica process. Silica, like you were earlier asking, you know, just like what's the difference? In the conventional farming, nobody really talks about silica. Mm -hmm. But silica is just so effective in, in establishing the aroma and flavor. I give you examples uh, of that. We, uh, like in, in June, we get the flower that happens. It, uh, grape, on the vine. On the vines. Uh -huh. Grape plants are very different. I jump from one thing to another, but it just comes to mind. So, I, sure. Uh, you know, like a lot of fruit trees, they initially flower first, uh -huh. and then they start leafing and, you know, the growth and everything, uh -huh. uh, like peach tree or almond and a lot of, uh, a lot of fruit trees. Uh -huh. Uh, grape plant is very different. Grape plants, initially, the leaf and the foliage and all the growth starts happening. And uh, it, it's a plant that the root system goes really deep down. Mm -hmm. uh, so it's very independent to the, to the effect of the earth. It also wants to raise up and go toward the sun but it really doesn't have that energy to be self-supporting. So it always has to crawl over like spiral into something to be able to, to get to the sky. And a lot of plants, you know, it's just like they, they kind of tell us what, what kind of planet do they uh, are more related to. Well, let's get back to, you were saying that, that the more distant planets um, affect the aroma and, and the flavor. flavor. Right. How, how does that happen? Because like, like I, I guess I was kind of taught that, you know, that comes from like the soil. Uh, you know, like it does the, come from the soil. It does, you know, it's just the elements that it's in the soil. Like uh, a very good percentage of the uh, planet Earth is surrounded by silica, which is into the soil. Yeah, um, but like, like, like the soil types that you have here, there is like how how deep is the soil before you hit basalt? Well, the, this uh, it depends from one place to another. It's anywhere from a couple of feet and a couple of feet to basalt. To, uh, right, it, wow. anywhere from a couple of feet up till we have a section, and later on we'll go and take a look at it up to 14, 15 feet. We, wow. Up, up on top, we have really deep soil before you, you actually hit the basalt uh, rock. But even in the regular soil, there is, there is, you know, quite a bit of like, you know, silica is mainly into rocks and sands. Mm -hmm. And there's uh, small elements even into 
clay soil, there's a percentage of the you know silica in there yeah. uh, that over millions of years have been mixed with things. Uh, you you were asking me about you know just like uh, uh, how how it affects like we this this uh, last couple of years uh, and and this is something that you know the part of biodynamic effect that it's like things are used in homeopathy amount you know it's just like it's a small minute amount of things uh -huh. we uh, we have this uh, one of the preparations is 501 which holds silica. And what that is that, you know, you stuff in, in the summertime, you, you crush some silica, some quartz of silica, and you put that in a uh, cow's horn, uh -huh. and you bury that underground for about six months. And uh, after you dig this out, you only need like one gram uh, of that uh, horn silica for one acre of land. Of course, it needs to be dynamized in water. And so, what does that do then? What does the powder uh, it, silica do? Right. It it affects several different things. It it kind of is one of the things that fights mildew. Huh. Okay. If you look at some of the plants. Uh, so, because this August was a pretty wet August for for us here, and so you're saying, like, I haven't looked at your vineyard in terms of mildew and things, but. You're saying that the silica helps fight that mildew. Very much so. Huh. This this year, a lot of people. I don't know if you've heard this or not. A lot of people are having big issues with mildew. Oh yeah. Yeah, I mean, it just has devastated a lot of uh, vineyards, uh, and a lot of people. Uh, I know one of the neighbors. They use like 21 pound of uh, sulfur, sulfur just in at the very beginning of. Uh, yeah, it's just like the very first spray that they did in three days, they put 21 uh, pound of that, try to get rid of mites, that's what, what they thought. But get rid of mites or mildew? Mites. 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 Yeah, they, huh. they had a big problem with mites, so they thought, you know, it does take care of mildew problems, so uh -huh. does. Yeah. Yeah, but uh, they thought that, you know, this is a way to fight uh, the mite problem that they have, they have that short shoot syndrome. Uh -huh. And somebody had told them that, you know, you spray potent amount of sulfur and it gets rid of those mites. It, it didn't. Uh, for the whole year, like, you know, here is one of our friends that's used 21 in the first spray, and for the whole year, we used 16 pounds of sulfur. 16 pounds? 16 pounds. That's all we've used. For all your vineyards? For, yeah. Per acre. Oh, per acre. Per okay. acre. Even with the biodynamic standards, you could use up to like 35 pounds of sulfur per year uh -huh. uh, in your farm. But we, we used, instead of using that, we use a lot of natural sulfur that's into the plants. Uh, your your earlier uh, question you, you asked, you know, how, how do you know that the silica does help? A lot of plants that they do have silica, they don't get mildew. Uh -huh. It's, uh, for example... Uh, but how do you know, um, because like if you're spraying with sulfur, how do you know it's not the sulfur that is uh, uh, suppressing the mildew as opposed to uh, the silica? Well, the amount that we're using is, is so minute that uh, the amount of sulfur sulfur that we're using 16 pounds if we didn't use the other material it it would really uh, be devastated uh -huh. I mean, if you use only 16 pounds of sulfur throughout the year you would have big issue with mildew yeah yeah what is this microclimate that you have here you're kind of in a bowl and you're uh, up butted up against the um, the coastal range here how much rain do you get here? In in the winter time, we get more rain than than uh, some of the other places, even in the city of McMinnville. But then uh, in the summer and fall, we get a lot less rain for huh. this area. It surpasses us. It just you can see everyone else getting rain gone, and it's like in the islands here. Really? You can see 
see the ring in the bride left. And so like the, you get less spring rain and less summer rain. No, spring we get more. The winter oh, the spring and, winter oh. and spring, uh, historically the data that's available, uh, we get a lot more rain. But then in, in the summer and fall, we get a lot less. Uh -huh. A lot of times in, a, in the fall, actually our next door neighbor, they've had more experience than we have had. They never worry about, you know, like the uh, rain on harvest time because it normally kind of really? passes us out. Wow. And actually there's a book, uh, it's called Wooden Sidewalk. One of the neighbor's uncles wrote that book and he grew up around this area. And, uh, you know, it's just like, that's that's the, the first time something documented that I read in that book that, that you know, it just in the summer and fall, it always kind of missed us. That Van Duzer corridor, I don't know what it, what it you know, does, it just comes around and, you know, just passes by. That, so, huh. you know, the neighboring hills still get that, but it's, it's really a great thing for us. Yeah, no yeah. kidding. Yeah. And it also helps with your mildew too. Correct. And yeah. besides that, we also have a lot of wind going through. Uh, you could actually, like down looking through that window, you could see how much, you know, just like the, the leaves. A little gentle. So yeah. So there's a lot of breeze. And, and for that same reason that we have so much wind, the skin of our berries is thicker. So therefore, like the winemaker needs to be a lot more careful not to extract so much tannin from the grape. So, you know, just like the uh, fruit that we sell to a lot of uh, other wineries, the first couple of years we really warn them that you really need to treat this uh, grape very gently. Don't, don't press it and don't do too much crunch down and things like that. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, it's just like the silica is really effective to get, uh, you know, to fight, uh, to fight mildew. And I want to go back to the effect of the, the more distant planets. You've really got my curiosity okay. going. <laughs> it's like, so you said, like, what was it? Like Mars and, uh, I think you said Jupiter and Venus. Um, Venus is a, uh, close. close star. Yeah, yeah. okay. So, so uh, like uh, Saturn yeah. and Jupiter and, uh, um, Mars. And Mars, right? And so I'm trying to, I'm trying to taste, I'm trying to taste the wine, and I'm trying to imagine. Okay, what influence do these planets have on on that wine? You know, I'm nosing it, and I'm tasting it, and I'm trying to imagine, like what I'm t because like normally it's like I don't taste, you know, Jupiter, you know, in a Pinot. So what? You know, it, 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 it's really a science to know about the plants and their relationship with, with different stars. Yeah. And uh, I could have her to bring a book and I could just kind of walk you through it because it's, it's not a, a thing that you could uh, kind of like in a matter of a few minutes cover that, but I'll be more than happy. Bring me that. Uh, Agricultural book uh, from Steiner. There's oh, one. Oh, that's a Steiner book. Yeah, uh -huh. there's yeah, actually one. Like okay. Just and then you know, also you mentioned that you know, the, there's elements you know that you taste, like let's say blueberry, just for example. You know, maybe a star can g give that blueberryness flavor to huh. that wine, or that you know that flavor compound into it. Just there's there's in that agriculture book. There's like they were saying Jupiter has a yellow white color that affects the plants. So if you see a blackberry um, flowering, it's kind of white and kind of inside the like the flowering has a yellow tint to it. So you kind of you're assuming it to yourself. So Jupiter is might be affecting this color of this plant. Huh. It's it's just like hmm. that. There there's certain things and. How accurate they are, uh, I, I'm still, you know, bouncing back and forth uh, to recognize all, all these things. But, uh, you know, just like, for example, uh, how does the forest start affect things? Like certain plants, if you dig them and just put it like that, for example, marigold, uh, that everybody wants to get rid of that, you know, you just take that out, uh -huh. 
you know, with a shovel and just put it upside down, with a uh -huh. up, uh -huh. then within a few minutes you see that everything goes toward the sun. But it, it just, even though you turn it over, but it doesn't take a few minutes that, that, that it, it, it goes toward the sun. Yeah. Uh, there is, uh, you know, as far as color, as far as uh, the shape of some of these, you know, plants and trees, uh, it, it, they've related them to diff different uh, stars and different, you know. Uh -huh. uh, of course, we can't say that that's the only thing that affects a plant. Yeah. Plant gets its energy from from the whole universe. Uh -huh. You know, it's just like the whole thing, and, and that's another thing in in biodynamic uh, farming. It's you don't look at the microcosm; you look at more than uh, into macrocosm of things. The the whole universe affects not only our life, but also you know, the planet uh, that we're living and the life that exists in our planet. Yeah. In what way does, um, I'm, try, I'm trying to imagine, you know, it's like, it, in, in some ways it's real obvious that the whole universe uh, affects, you know, all of us. Mm -hmm. And then, in, in some ways too, it's like I'm trying to understand what that means. Even. You know, how does it affect, you know, like the universe, and, and our minds can't even comprehend like this universe, like how big it is, or uh, you know what it means, and, and all those kinds of things, and what's out there. So I'm trying to comprehend, like how that affects, you know, like the grapevine out there. Right. Yeah. It it just uh, I, I was uh, actually uh, trying to explain this, and uh, one thing led to another, and I forgot to tell you. Like we uh, we sprayed the right, you know, that uh, this is a normal thing that the process of flowering happens anywhere from seven to ten days okay for for the great plants uh -huh. okay and then uh, we want to control how much uh, flowering happens in a section and each portion of the vineyard it's different so normally it uh, in order to control especially if if you're fearful that is going to be a rain coming because when when the rain comes in, it washes all the flowers. So a lot of time, a lot of years that you don't have as as much fruit is because of the rain hitting the flowers and they fall. So for example, if we hear the, that you know like four or five days from now we're going to have a heavy rain coming in. We go ahead and spray that form silica, and we've done that. Huh. And the process of seven to ten days happen in one day. And here's like one gram of form huh. silica for one acre. But they dilute it. Well, it it, okay. it it needs to get into the water and and be dynamized in the water, and then spray. And you spray it directly onto the plant, then. Correct. Directly Correct. onto the plant. On the foliage, yeah. Uh, uh -huh. yeah. But it, it part of the, if you've been hearing of people around Oregon today, you know, they're saying that we have really, really light set fruit or they have really heavy set fruit. And then you have to realize that for us, for this vineyard, we started flowering on July 18th. So actually, on July 18th, oh. I declared about 50% above flowering. So that means I start counting down to July 18th. Like for the flowering? Or yeah, no, the 50% above, but July, um, about like the 16th or the 15th, um, we noticed flowering was happening, occurring around the vineyard. Uh -huh. So we, you know, he made, the, he made a call and decision wise and say, okay, we need to spray this section. And then within that 24 hours, with the silica, with the silica within that 24 hours, I saw a significant difference. And then it come to me that day when I like 50% above, by the time meaning I kind of like 65 to 75%, I start calling where the sections are flowering, 100, like saying flowering starting, meaning I can count down to harvest uh -huh. to try to make, you know, make sure that I have the winery, you know, ship shape. Uh -huh. So 
well, I, we, we did, we came together and we declared on July 18th, fi, um, yeah, July 18th was a 50 cent, 50% above huh. flowering. But you, within the one, like I, this is my first, not even my first, but with him being related in the winery and in the vineyard, seeing that spray in that 24 hour, it was a big significant difference uh -huh. that I was just so impressed. Huh. That it was just amazing, huh. but it, it was a big significant. And then I think you, you, what my dad's trying to say for the definition of you know, what you're looking for, pretty much is an ultra organic way. But you're we're kind of looking at the astrology and the organisms found in plants today, and using those compounds and putting it back into the vineyard. Mm -hmm. Because that would, that's more of a layman term to mm -hmm. say but to get someone to understand people. Yeah. yeah, and that's what I need is kind of like the... the, the yeah, know, so we're taking, we're taking two philosophies because biodynamic comes from biologic dynamic. Uh -huh. Saying, taking the biology, you know, science of it, but also taking the dynamic of the stars and the moons and uh -huh. everything being aligned yeah. and the weather conditions. Like the full moon... I've seen this to myself. Gravity pulls different when a full moon. Well, sure. So therefore, effects. You know, that's a true factor on everything. It kind of affects on people's moods, affects on every water, affects on you know wine too. Huh. Uh, like to me, I won't top right. I top before the full moon, but after the full moon is over, I will top one more time, just because. The gravity is pulling the wine to the wood, so it's absorbing more. Huh. So, I mean, gravity does that. I mean, the full moon does that, but it's gravitational force. Yeah. So, therefore, it's, you know, there is, you're taking what biodynamic is, you have to take a sense of what's happening up there, and you have to take a sense of what ha is happening around your surroundings. Yeah. So, a lot of your questions is in this three, four phases. <laughs> that are, heavily, that are heavily underlined. Right. <laughs> <laughs> so you're more than welcome if you want to. Can I make a photocopy of, sure, the, of sure, those then? Sure, sure, sure. Uh, or even if you want, then you could add this for a few days. I mean, the, the, the well, then I have to return it, though. Okay. Uh, so yeah, we could, we could have yeah, it. Yeah, a photocopy. Copy. Sure. Yeah, yeah. and um, actually, I will tell Matt to photocopy the other book so it doesn't have that all of the underlines on that book. I don't mind underlining. But underline actually takes his attention to those places yeah. because it's the very same thing that he's uh, talking about. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Um, let's get um, to like what we see out here is like the how how important is the soil uh, and the type of soil that you have? And I, I forgot to ask you even what kind of soil you have. Yeah, the, we we have varieties of soil in here. The property being five hundred thirty-eight acres. It's got a lot of different topsoil, and it's a lot, you know, a lot of people only think of topsoil, but wow. it's it's really silly to only think of the topsoil because the root of uh, grape plants sometimes it goes a couple of hundred feet down. A couple hundred. Couple of hundred that's feet. The that's the. That's what I'm saying. Ever, it's just uh, like it, it. It really. It it just wow. like uh, to get the moisture and everything. Uh, oh, so then it's going even in, even where you have 14 feet, it's going well into the basalt. Oh, yeah, it's it's no the grape plants, and, and as a matter of fact, they call grape plant like a prisoner of the earth because <laughs> it just like it wants to go deep, deep down, and that, that that's what I was saying earlier. A lot of plants that you see that they're very dependent to water, like let's say a uh, a willow tree. That you know, just weeping willow. It always the the leaves and the branches and everything. It just wants to go, you know, toward toward the earth. Uh -huh. But you know, you see some of the other plants that they they actually want to go toward the sun a lot more. Uh -huh. Some of them just like you know, like that. Is it the? It's called cypress. Uh, uh -huh. Cypress. It's you know going both ways. But then the, the uh, uh, I don't know the English word, but it's just uh, another evergreen tree that it just like, it kind of goes really 
narrow toward, toward the sun. So some, you know, just like even animals, animals like uh, a pig. A pig is very much related to the earth. Mm -hmm. I mean, it just, even the ear and the whole body, it seems like it's going toward the earth. Uh -huh. And it's all, you know, always trying to get things dug out with a, you know, with its nose and everything, get to the roots and get to yeah. the, you know, now a, a, an animal, and, and a lot of that is in this book and other books, like an animal, like a uh, cow is more uh, in tune with water. A, an animal like a horse or, or a deer, it's very nervous and very much, you know, just like a, uh, like a uh, horse wants to, to kind of like, you know, uh, when it even gets, you know, it's, it's nature is very much in tune with, with the stars than, than the planet Earth. Well, what about vines? Vines are kind of like, you know, as I was explaining earlier, it's like a prisoner of the Earth because the root system wants to go down, uh -huh. but then the, the plant itself wants to grow up but it's not, it's not, you know, it can't support itself. It always wants to be supported. So uh, in this book, it talks about a uh, grape plant being more related to Jupiter. Huh, in uh, what way? Uh, that I, I, I don't recall actually, yeah. but it does explain, and, and it's probably in those few pages huh. that I... Uh, that's interesting. This is really interesting. I'm it, it's it's yeah. really fascinating, but yeah. it's not something that you could really grasp. But myself, I've read it over and over and over. And it's not only me being a dumb foreigner. Uh -huh. I, well, I that makes two of us. <laughs> <laughs> no, I didn't mean that. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I did. <laughs> yeah, it, it, it really takes takes time to comprehend, uh, uh, comprehend it. But I, I found it really fascinating. But more than anything, it's just the result I've seen. Uh -huh. it, it, you know, this, this farm, I recall when I first was developing this pro piece of property, one of the neighbors after he found out that we were putting a fence around because he used to come and hunt this place all the time, uh -huh. he got pretty upset and he came in and started yelling and screaming saying, you know, this land is good for nothing. Uh -huh. you know, why are you wasting your time and money and, and you're putting a fence and everything around? Yeah. Because they thought nothing would grow over here. And we had some sections uh, that, I'll, I'll take you and show you those sections, uh, that the grapes, it, it would, you know, fruit and everything, but the fruit wouldn't ripen because huh. the soil was so poor. But, you know, what is poor? Yeah. Huh. Yeah, the, the, the soil didn't have any nutrition. So it's just the main purpose of biodynamic farming is to novelize the soil, to uh -huh. bring the things that the soil needs, to bring that to the soil. So and, and then, it, you know, so to novelize the soil and kind of create a balance between calcium process and the silica process. Uh -huh. You know, it's just like things want to grow, and that's that's calcium process. But then, you know, when things want to grow, there's too many microorganisms and things like that. All sorts of disease start developing. So then, it's the silica process that you suppress those diseases with. So you know, it's just like you you want to create a kind of equilibrium between the calcium forces and the silica forces. So then, you know, like in the biodynamic, what's the effect, you know, what's the relationship between biodynamic farming and climate and terroir? You know, like the climate and, and uh, um, you know, and the soil type and, and uh, it, you know, the things on the earth. Yeah, it's, it's very much actually pretty much the kind of definition of, of the terroir is to take all of that into consideration because it's not only the soil, it's, it's the 
it's the weather, it's the climate, it's the water, it's the air. It, all of these need to, to, you know, it will affect. And, you know, we have like one side of the vineyard being very much different than, than the other. And it's not only the soil that affects that. It's, it's also as, you know, like a lot of times, uh, and, and you, hopefully you'll notice this as we go with the ATV, you're going through this kind of the same area. In one area, you feel like the warmth mm -hmm. a lot more. And then in another area that you go, it's just like, uh, it's mm -hmm. really cool. Uh, uh, the, the water and, and, you know, what kind of water you have there. Uh, we have several wells in, in this property. Some of them, you, you just uh, the pump that water. It's got kind of that odor into it that's like a sulfur odor, mm -hmm. but then there's another area, another well, that you get that water, that the water is so crisp and mm -hmm. clean and not heavy. Yeah. Uh, so it's just, there's just so many things come into play. Yeah. Uh, One of the things I read on your website, you said that, uh, you know, 90% of winemaking comes from uh, the vineyard. Yeah. What, what does that mean? That's actually, in a sense, like what we're trying to say is that, Wine is such an, you know, beautiful structure, and it's e it's not meant for it's easy to make or anything like that. But if you have good grapes, you can make excellent wine. If you have bad grapes, it's harder to make a good wine. Uh -huh. I give you an example. Uh, Excuse me. Yeah. Uh, so, oh, here, let me finish. So then what we're trying to do is that our yeast that we're using is a native yeast. We're not producing, we're not buying. Native to? Na native. We don't use commercial, commercial yeast, yeast for our winery. Uh -huh. uh -huh. And so you're getting the yeast from where? From, from the grapes. Well, from the grapes from the grape itself. itself. From the but okay. I mean, there's two sides of where the winemaking comes. There will be, you know, my friend and I were discussing is I'm actually 50-50. I believe that 50% of, you know, there's a 50% chance of there's native yeast out there. But I also think in the winery, there is also yeast found in the air. So there's huh. two ways we can see this. There is yeast in the winery, there is yeast in the vineyard. Uh -huh. So it's- But that's not his question. His question. Yeah, I, mean, yeah. I know, no, no, but I mean, that's where we're saying 90% of winemaking is done in the vineyard. Uh -huh. So I'm saying that that's one, one, one technique, malactive, Bacterium, so malolactic is the secondary fermentation, which is malic acid going to lactic acid. Malic is like that, you know, kind of a, you know, a green apple taste, and then the lactic acid is just like a very softer, t you know, taste acid in wine. Uh -huh. That the acidity and the crisp is to that. We're not using that in ourselves in our in this winery too. So again, that could be found in the winery, a vineyard. Uh -huh. By meaning, in a sense, that everything that we're trying to, you know, you can buy in store or like a store, you can find it in the vineyard. So, okay. and so you're not adding any external yeast, uh, except our whites, except so for our whites, and so we're buying our Pinot Gris still from, from other people. Uh -huh. So, I, I that's a harder <laughs> okay. Thing. Have you ever grown a garden? Yeah, organic too. Right. Okay. How does your tomato that you grow taste from from the st uh, stuff that you buy? Well, it's a whole different ballgame because, like, the the stuff in the store is harvested when it's still green because they have to ship it and it's you know what a week or two weeks out, and things like that. And you know, you go to the vine and you pick it; it's ripe. Right. Um, even if the same, you know, the same uh, type of. But is it is it only the the I agree with you, but is it only the time factor or is it other factors? Well know? there's other factors too. It's like, you know, we use like we have llamas and llamas, you know, so like and I used to have chickens and so I used to use chicken, you know, manure mm -hmm. and all that kind of stuff, you know. So all that uh, mm -hmm. you know goes into it too. Right. Yeah. It's it's the same thing uh, in a vineyard. It's just like how you farm. Uh, it really affects not only the taste, but also the aroma and flavor and, and the longevity 
of, of the uh, of fruit, fruit. Uh -huh. very much so. He, he could, you know, just like uh, to prove the point to you, uh, when, when grapes ripen, just go to any, any vineyard that it's got the best soil and everything and grab like a Five. cluster or two of that and and then uh, actually taste that wine don't you know just like pick from from one place mm -hmm. like that and then pick from a, another place that's been farmed through organic or biodynamic and taste it it uh -huh. just it'll tell you huh. we we had you know we uh, we don't have uh, Riesling, well we planted some just recently, but in between our plants there's some Riesling plants and uh, uh -huh. uh, the guys haven't picked those uh, till we picked everything else and we picked those and then we bought some Riesling grape from, uh, from the neighbor and I, I gave that to like about 15-20 people and almost unanimously I, I, and a lot of these people are not professionals nothing you know like that uh -huh. and they kind of look the same uh, and and almost everybody unanimously said you know that uh, the ones that we grew tasted much better and then there was a different scent too I mean I don't know if you wa ever walked around I mean for the white wines we walk around in a, like in a row that has white wine like Muscat or Riesling, um, Pinot Blanc, they have a different aroma than the Pinot Noir. Oh yeah, and especially I mean, Muscat. Yeah, I especially Muscat know. when you got, when you walk in there, you're like, where's that honey coming yeah. from? It's pretty much the same thing, what he's saying, is like, you know, you, visually you can see, you know, this grape is doing, it's healthy, it's happy, and and then you taste it and you're like, wow, it's even, you know, taste wise, it's all this. And just taking this in school wise, you know, getting a degree and you know, I got a, my degree, a whole degree is called food science and fermentation um, option. No, it's food science and technology and fermentation wow. science. But I have, you know, some, I had to take some classes of food classes. There was one class we had a professor telling us Today they take the o like ozone, like a, it's like an O3 shot to the tomato, put in a, in like a tomato vine, and then this preserves this plant when they pick it, and they can keep this on out in the store for two to three weeks longer wow. than a great uh, than a tomato that has doesn't have this shot. Yeah. But then was the taste factor which we asked, and he says, "What do you think?" And he says it's going to be much diluted than the other tomato. So it's pretty much again, it's but the you way could, you could do the very same thing. You could achieve like having tomatoes that uh, age much longer mm -hmm. with having some companion plant, which you know, like with stinging nettle. Oh, I'm saying that's yeah. true, very yeah. true. But they're t today, tech science, technology is we're trying to preserve our food in a shorter way like what kind you're doing because what I tell people I mean what we do is m longer you know m much manual yeah than what you know other farmers are trying to do because they just want to get these fruit out of the you know off their farm and thrown in a store yeah and again that must you know for me it's it's, it's a love it has to be a love you have to be passionate of what you're doing. Uh -huh. And I could see what my father's trying to achieve. He's very you know, passionate because when he was younger, he was always telling us this, that back home, their food was 10 times more flavorful than what I'm getting today. Mm -hmm. I went overseas in, um, to New Zealand and I was calling them and it's like, the food here is just totally different from what I was getting at home. They're, their lambs, I mean, they're, you know, New Zealand lambs every, produce everywhere, but just getting there fresh was totally flavorful. The fruit, the peach, the nectarines had more flavor because, But you know, it's not, uh, it's not only the flavor. If you look at the data in the last hundred years, mm -hmm. 
every 10 years, if you look at the, uh, you know, all the nutrition values of every food, every, uh, you know, wheat, rice, and everything else, everything, all the elements, are, you know, as far as nutritional value, has decreased so much. Very true, because I mean, they're the trying mass production on this yeah. today. Well, it's, it's just all the chemicals, so all the using. poison that we put under our, our food sources. I mean, it's just really And like the one thing, like my sisters and I can take, when we have, we have our own cattle, and we, when we butcher them, and we take, like, you know, grocery store meat and home meat, we, I call it home meat, is it's totally different. I like the, the home meat, Versus, because I think there's a kind of different stinkiness to the grocery store meat to me. And again, you put, you know, you're putting, you're trying mass production of what you're trying to do. Yeah. And you, if you have to not think, by meaning I'm saying simple, you have to think simple by in the farming aspect of don't use chemicals, don't use, you know, a faster rate, you know, a faster way to get your product out. Take a little slower time, but you will get a better quality. Yeah. And, and one of the main reasons for, you know, just like uh, plants not producing too well under chemicals is, you know, we feed them so much salt. And, you know, all these chemicals are based on salt, different uh -huh. salts. And then these salts make the plant so thirsty, so it just absorbs wants to absorb more and more water. And it, it really takes away, not only because it enters all those chemicals into the plant and for the food source, but also it gets you know rid of the, the all nutrition and then the taste is not as good as you know some of the things that you, you could grow uh, diff differently. Yeah, one of the things that you know I read on your website, you said that you know, it's like your goal is to be self-sustaining. It's like you don't want to, uh, yeah, I think you call it outsourced inputs. You're, yeah. you're trying to avoid outsourced inputs. Well, what, what does that mean? Okay, for example, uh, and, and that's, that's another concept of biodynamic. It's just a farm, it's a sick farm if you have to import different things to it. Uh -huh. So you try to, you know, here we pretty much uh, do our own composting. We pretty much do, uh, you know, make our own preparations and grow our own herbs and everything. Because, like, even even as far as herb, I could buy herbs ten times cheaper than having to pay my guys to pick those. Mm -hmm. But then the the herbs that I buy from another place, I don't know what condition they've been grown. So it's just like when, you know, everything comes from within your place because everything is in connection with each other. Mm -hmm. So it, it, we try not to import anything from uh, any, any other farm and just do everything here ourselves. So that's the goal. Right. And then you want to read that statement that Steiner says, it's like a healthy farm. Yeah, a healthy farm would be one that uh, could produce, I don't have my glasses, uh, produce everything it needs from within itself. Uh -huh. So that, that's the that philosophy yeah. of his, yeah. you know. If we could produce everything in here and not bring anything outside and try to contaminate anything, if we can produce and Yeah, we make our own compost. We, we, uh, we, uh, as far as sprays, we, we use our own herbs and flowers. We uh, pretty much uh, do our own preparations. And I could take you that some of the preparations actually we put into, you know, like uh, combining like a flower. With that actually, I'm animal. very interested in seeing that yeah. and actually photographing sure. uh, that. Let's see, one last question that I have um, here is like, um, you're all on your own rootstock? Then only, only the first 13. Only the first, first 13. 13 is now. Okay. Uh, the first 13 is uh, self-rooted. Okay. Uh, but then everything else we grafted it and we have a we have several uh, greenhouses that we uh, we graft everything ourselves. Uh-huh. 
and then not only use it for our own vineyard, but we also sell those plants. And the everybody. rootstock, it's like, how do you make a, a decision about what rootstock is going to go where? I mean, okay. is that like soil type, or is sure. it, you know? No, it's a combination of a lot of different things. Uh, it is, you know, how thin or thick your soil is, how much water you have in your soil. Uh, like, for example, I give you, you know, there's a, a special rootstock that's called 1616C, and that, that could take a lot of wet peat. Mm -hmm. So areas that we have springs, we just put that rootstock in there. Uh -huh. Now there's another clone. So that, that would be, and it's also like, uh, I don't know that particular rootstock, but there's other rootstocks that are like that, that uh, like they're also devigorated so that. Um, like R RG uh, is the, the, you put that riparian floor in, in, uh, in areas that you have really deep soil. Yeah. Uh, there's, you know, uh, because then and there you, you want to kind of control, you don't want, you know, with great plants, you don't, you don't want, want a tree. Yeah, yeah, it's gotta be a balance. And uh, even though we put the least vigorous plants in, you know, deep soil areas still, you could go and, you know, you could tell they get really big fruit, uh -huh. they get abundance of the fruit, but is that fruit as good as some of the areas that stress, you know, the stress areas, the fruit burns with, a, you know, a little bit of extra sunshine and things like that, even though people know, some of the people that we sell fruit to, that it's produce as much, but they don't want to give up that area and get the fruit from another area that produces a lot more. Yeah. It's well, just because of that flavor. And when you were talking about production though too, it's like I read on your website that you're, you're trying to get like one and a half to two, two uh, tons. tons per acre. That's a little low, lower compared to a lot of like growers are getting, you know, like they're, because of the way they're paid and stuff, they're getting like two and a half to three tons. Right. Actually, we're facing that problem right now because we used to sell fruit by the ton. Yeah. And then everybody wanted, wanted to drop the fruit, drop the fruit. And sometimes in, in just one year, we actually got like three quarter of a ton because everybody wanted to drop, drop the off. fruit. Yeah. Now yeah. we're selling to most of the people. We said, well, okay, we'll sell it by the acre. Now the very same people that they were saying drop the fruit, drop the fruit. Now it's all oh, everything. Is beautiful. <laughs> yeah. Seriously, they're saying everything looks beautiful. No, it's just like don't don't you know only maybe the burned one, but no everything is looking great. The plant is healthy. So, but for our own, you know, we're trying to have like about. And one again, and just again that goes months. by quality. You know, not by. I mean, there's two things you have to worry about in the nutrients of the grapes and you have when you're under crop you have too much nutrients because all those new nutrients are just like oh well, where do I go uh -huh. and they go in these grapes and then there have you have just too much and then you have problems you could have problems in fermentation and then you have overcropping not enough yeah. nutrients which again can have cause problems in fermentation we want to have and that. it becomes herbal and yeah. vegetal when, Take, when, yeah. when so you the, the, have there's that. too much fruit and the plant is too happy, too green, <laughs> then then you don't have that aroma and flavor. And so you're not growing vegetable. If you were growing vegetable, maybe more fruit and area that would be. But yeah. for for wine making, you do want the plants to be stressed a little bit. You don't want, you know, it's just like there again, I, the concept that I was telling you, it's just like the grape plants are different. So it, it just grows, grows, grows until it flowers. From then, you should control and not, not to give, yeah, you should not give food to it after that. Let it go like within. So it's just like after the summer solstice, very, very little, you know, food source and nutrition uh -huh. needs to be given. So it's just like then 
you have something that is just more aromatic, more flavor, and uh, you know, a better wine could be made from something that's better tasting food than, than something that's just abundant of the food. And it, 